Okay, Katie, let me first thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, can you start off by introducing sure. yourself and your work? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Dr. Katie Randall. Uh, I recently got my PhD in rhetoric and writing from Virginia Tech. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and my work focuses broadly on health communication, and I've been able to apply that in a couple of different cool interdisciplinary ways, which I've really loved. Uh, my dissertation focused specifically on health communication in refugee resettlement. Uh, I have done another project looking at historical public health communication in combating tuberculosis in like the early to mid 20th century. Uh, and then most recently, as you guys read, uh, investigating the distinction made in public health between this idea of droplet and aerosol infection. Those are the kind of the big three areas that my research has like coalesced around. Awesome. Um, so how did you wind up in health communication? Can you give us your origin story? Yes. Oh, my origin story, whether villain or superhero, you get to decide, I guess. Um, so my origin story, I, in undergrad, I was an English major, uh, got my master's in English literature. Uh, and while I was um, doing my master's, I was working at um, a publishing company that focused on end of life care. And so we produced materials for hospices and hospitals and home cares about uh, how to, you know, an end of life um, communication, basically, like for doctors on how to have conversations with patients about dying and grief, and really those kinds of difficult topics, like when, um, when someone needs to go on a ventilator or do not resuscitate orders. And then we also produced things written for general non-expert populations, right? So people who don't have medical backgrounds where we had, we were keeping in mind that people had lower levels of health literacy, that they may not be able to follow complicated healthcare instructions, that they may not know all the technical jargon. And so we were writing things for them, like, what do you do if you have to take care of a loved one who is dying at home? Uh, and so I was really fascinated uh, with the idea of of like health communication there and communicating health in different ways for different audiences, right? It was a very rhetorical view of language and communication, but I had no idea that medical rhetoric was a thing. None at all. I was like, I study Beowulf, right? And I, I'm like, I'm an editor at this publishing company and a, a medical writer and I love it, but I didn't think it was like a thing you studied. Uh, and then I came across a chapter uh, in Judy Siegel's book, and Judy Siegel is a, a prominent scholar in uh, rhetoric of health and medicine. She wrote a book uh, back in the early 2000s, um, kind of, and uh, that has that became very popular in the field. But she has a chapter in that book about um, metaphor and health communication, and uh, and specifically in like you know these like war metaphors against cancer and like people dying and things like that. And that was so fascinating to me. And that's when I discovered that when I did more research into that, I was like, oh, medical rhetoric is like a thing, a thing you can get a PhD in. I want to do that. Um, and so I ended up at Virginia Tech. And that's, even though I don't, I didn't wind up studying death and dying in, in the way that I did in my professional work, um, I've kept that same sort of through line of um, health literacy and uh, communicating complicated uh, health and medical uh, topics for different kinds of audiences across disciplines and uh, specialties. So that's that was that's that's where I started. That um, reminds me of I think it's Mike Trice's definition of tech writing when he tries to explain it, and it's about how do you take complex information and make it usable across contexts yeah. and across literacy levels. And mm -hmm. it really yeah that little pivot um yeah is exactly exactly to me what's interesting about it like yeah how do you take something that is so difficult and so important and make it do something in the world you know yeah yeah and that was one of the I you know I was never interested in getting a PhD in literature I was like I'm gonna get an MA and be done with it I <laughs> love old English poetry but I like don't feel the need to get a PhD in this Mm -hmm. um, because I was like, literature is great and obviously does something really valuable in the world, but, um, the so like technical communication and, and, um, and rhetorical studies have to do with like a very, 
it, it's like, it feels much more timely. Like it's a, it's a very much more direct kind of intervention. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, that really has appealed to me about health communication that I can write something down in a certain way and it changes the way people understand that information. Yeah. Um, and it's like magic. That's how I came across from gender studies. It was, you know, yeah. like it's the same kinds of questions, right? Um, mm-hmm. Around health and justice and how do we talk about these things? But it's something that's like, okay, so like now what do we do? And then. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. How do we um, like put it into practice? How do we make that happen? Yeah. Speaking of putting things into practice. Um, yeah, uh, we were saying just before we before I hit record. Sorry, I'm just going to keep wrestling. I don't know what he wants. Um, yeah, do it. <laughs> allegedly the calm one, um, but not the bribed one currently. So he's just heading on the table. I think he's going to look out the window. Mm. Being like a cat. Um, yeah, so in your article, um, you and the team that you're working with, um, actually, can I give you a different question? You're yeah, working on I mean, a really interesting team in that um, in that group, um, and I gave I gave folks the link to the Wired article, which kind of gives the tra- traces through the history of how that project um, came to exist. But I don't think folks mm-hmm. have written it. Um, have read it. Um, could you give us like just a little quick overview of how you came to be involved in this team and what it was like being the tech writing person on such a broad interdisciplinary team? Yeah, it was very cool. Um, and so how that started is that you have uh, Dr. Lindsay Marr and Dr. Jose Jimenez, uh, who are both aerosol scientists who had been trying to like sound the alarm about COVID being airborne. Um, Jose had participated as a researcher on a study that had shown infection, uh, like it's one that circulates quite a lot. It's about like the choir and how members of the choir, even though they were social distanced in the same room, uh, there were multiple infections, um, from one source. And they were like, but they were like 10 feet apart from each other. How did they infect each other? And Jose and his team were like, it's, it's airborne. Like it's, that's how it's infecting people is in the air. So they were talking and they were expressing frustration about like, why, like, even though we're saying this is airborne, why is the CDC and the WHO and these public health organizations, um, so why are they so reluctant to admit that it's airborne? Why won't they listen? And Lindsay said, I, wa- I want to know like where this happened, because I don't know how people got this idea that if it's like under five microns in size, it's aerosol. But if it's over five microns in size, it's a droplet because that just doesn't play out in in the science. And they realized that they needed, like Lindsay was like, we need a historian. Uh, We need a historian to figure out where this um, discrepancy came from. And so she reached out to Tom Ewing, um, who was a medical history professor at, at Virginia Tech, whom I had worked with. He's my collaborator on that project I mentioned about tuberculosis, sanatoria and treatment in the mid, early to mid 20th century. Um, so, and he and I have been working for years on these different projects. And he, so she reached out to him and he said, I have a grad student, um, not in my department. She's actually in English. She's like, I have a grad student who would be very, very good at tracking down like how these terms, uh, kind of like how these definitions of these terms got codified. And Lindsay said, okay, great. Bring her on board. And so this is, I say this because students are listening, but I made sure I was getting paid for this project, right? Like Lindsay arranged funding for me through the College of Civil and Environmental Engineering. So I Mm -hmm. was getting paid Um, and I was trying to finish my dissertation and my dissertation advisor had told me that under no circumstances was I allowed to take on a new project. And I reached out to her and I said, but um, like, can I do, can I do this one? Because this one sounds really cool. And she said, you should do this one because it does sound very cool. So I owe that to to her as well. But um, so I was brought on the team. It was uh, Lindsay Marr, Jose Jimenez, Tom Ewing, me, and then Lydia Bariba, who is a fluid dynamics professor at MIT, uh, who also has studied sort of like how aerosol clouds, um, like the physics of like aerosol clouds. I don't, um, it's it's things that are so far out of my wheelhouse, but, um, just a really brilliant team of like very, very interesting, um, and dedicated people. 
And so my job, you know, I, I was, um, you know, not just, I don't, I don't, they didn't know what medical rhetoric was when I was brought on. They, they would refer to me and Tom as the historians. And I would be like, I mean, I am doing historical work, but like by training, I am not a historian, right? right. Um, I am, I am a rhetorician. And um, so looking at uh, the, my, my job on that team was to go back through the literature and I did citation tracing. So I started with the public health information from the WHO and the CDC. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, who do they cite to justify them saying that this is droplet transmission? And then, so I'd go to those sources and those sources would say droplets or anything over five microns, aerosols or anything under five microns. And I'd say, okay, who do they cite to justify that? And like on and on and on. And I found in, in, you know, tracing that back to the early 20th century, there were miscitations where they would say, oh, this source says that. And I'd go to the source and I'd be like, that source doesn't say that at all. Right. Um, but no one had ever really done that kind of deep dive. So these things were getting cited over and over kind of uncritically. Uh, non critically they were they were getting cited without really investigating um, where those citations had come from. Uh, and so then I was able to go to go back to the team and say, okay, I'm seeing these instances where the the term airborne is getting um, conflated across disciplines, right? Airborne means something different to aerosol scientists than it does to epidemiologists. And so where they have competing, uh, they're using it in competing ways, right? Which is a very rhetorical, that, that's a rhetorician's, uh, you know, bread and butter, right? How, where do these terms originate? How are these terms being used and to what effect, right? For these different audiences. And so right. that was, that was my contribution to that team, not just going back and doing the history, but looking at the history of language and the history of how this term has, has shifted and the impacts that it has in technical communication, and health communication and now from, from these public or health organizations. That was a long explanation of my role on the team, but that was, that's sort of the spark notes version. Yeah. And, and that thread around like those different terms being used in different ways by different audiences and nobody realizing, right. That they were talking about two different things. Yeah. They're just talking past each other. Right. right. The aerosol scientists are like, why don't they understand what we're saying? And I'm like, well, it's because, you know, they're epidemiologists, like they're coming at it from a totally different framework. Mm -hmm. And they, so you're using the same term, but you're understanding what that means very differently. And we see that play out in the historical research as well, where you have, you know, air, does airborne mean what stays in the air? Does airborne mean what it can, what's small enough to be inhaled? Mm -hmm. Does airborne mean what's small enough to be infectious? So you have, and people were using that term to mean all those different things mm -hmm. um, without defining it. So, I mean, obviously like intent and like the why questions are hard to answer because none of us have time machines. But yeah. do you think it is just um, that question of audience and talking past each other that let that message get so mixed up and lost over the years? I do. I think, I think it's a number of things. I think that's a big, that one is a big part of it. Um, I think that, you know, we have this idea of science as being objective. I mean, not we, but like, I say, I'd say generally there's oh, this idea. Yeah. 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 Not we, we <laughs> know better. Right. But like generally <laughs> there's this idea that science is like objective, that science is not driven by social forces that you have this thing where like a scientist in a lab makes a discovery and they say, I made a discovery, it gets peer reviewed. And then everyone just accepts that they're like, yes, new ways of understanding. Mm -hmm. Right. But we, that's actually not how science works. Right. Science is people and science is communication and that kind of stuff gets messy. Um, and so in the early 20th century, when you had, um, you had public health folks saying, okay, um, miasma theory. So we had miasma theory for a long time and miasma theory said the air, the air is bad. bad. You get sick from bad air. air. So, so we, we want to make sure like if the air smells bad, it's unhealthy. If um, too many people are in a space, it's unhealthy. So we want to like, we want fresh air. So people would go to like the mountains or the seaside if they felt sick, right? They wanted to get out of the city. Um, 
And then when germ theory came along and it was like, oh, actually germs cause disease, not just like the air. Um, then it, there was this big public health push towards, okay, let's wash hands. Let's sanitize surfaces. Let's get germs out of the water. And there were such huge, um, like a, just a really drastic improvement in public health because of those measures mm -hmm. that any, you know, the, the, the scientists or the researchers that were saying, hey, actually we're seeing uh, infectious disease in these particles that are in the air. These other folks were like, no, no, we're done with bad air. We're, bad air is old. That's out. This is in. Right. And so science, we, we, ha we want to move forward. We don't want to go backwards. And this is something that Mildred and William Wells, when they were studying airborne infection or airborne transmission of what stays in the air, they actually wrote this in one of their articles in the 1930s, where they were like, just because we're saying that there's a possibility of aerosol infection does not mean we're saying that miasma theory needs to come back. That's not the same thing, but they had to, that sort of gives us a little insight into like, how the scientific conversations were going at that time mm -hmm. where it's like, no, we're done. We're done with that. Yeah. Um, and move around anticipating the objection so you can, yeah, diffuse it and move yeah, on. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so even though, we, you know, it's, it's tricky to put together these sort of historical conversations when you don't have, you may just have a few articles here and there and you're like, what was going on that made them feel like they had to say, this isn't miasma theory. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, was it, was it already an objection being posed or were they just anticipating what might happen? But I mean, basically though, even though Mildred and William Wells were showing that infectious particles could stay airborne much longer than people thought, they didn't just drop out of the air after like three feet. Um, the scientific community was like, mm, mm, no, we've got a good thing going with this sort of like droplet, like close contact idea of transmission that like drop within a few feet mm -hmm. or like something falls on a surface and you touch it and put it in your face or this idea of, of things traveling long distances, like just wasn't, um, it, it took, it took, I mean, the, the wells were writing in, in the thirties mm -hmm. and airborne infection really wasn't accepted by the scientific community until tuberculosis. There were studies about tuberculosis in the sixties where they showed pretty much without question that these guinea pigs they had set up were getting infected with tuberculosis. Through and these, the air. these are the ones that they had up in the, um, in the ceiling in the vents in the hospitals, right? Yeah. Little guinea so pig cages gu like rattling around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guinea pigs. They had the guinea pigs like on the floor above and they had the vent up from the patient's room and they were actually able to, and this is, this is the science that's too complicated for me to know all the right words, but like they were able to um, like, like trace the origin of the tuberculosis in the guinea pigs mm -hmm. to like the same strain that had been in that patient. Mm -hmm. So basically they were able to say like, there's no way these guinea pigs could have gotten this other than through this air circulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with that, you know, we're also dealing, dealing with like an evidence question too. Right. And these, when we're talking about different fields, the, the standard of evidence that different mm -hmm. fields accept yeah. and public health says, okay, if things were airborne, then shouldn't everybody be getting sick? Everybody who's ever been in a room with a sick person. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas aerosol scientists are like, well, we, there's the potential for, we're seeing these infectious particles mm -hmm. go far. Right. And so again, it's, it's different standards of evidence across fields. I've, I don't remember what your question was. Back. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like talking and I'm like, I've lost the thread. I don't know what the question was. Well, the question is really just like, well, like where, how do these ideas get lost? And like, that's exactly, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. Right. That we have different audiences yeah. thinking about things in different ways. They're using similar terms in different ways without and because it's the same term, they don't realize it means something different. Um, they're looking for different things. They're asking different questions, right? The questions mm -hmm. you ask are going to shape what you find out. Um, yes, that, and yeah, the, that's exactly and, it. Yeah, and as you say, what it takes to substantiate a point, um, the evidence that works in different contexts varies as well. I mean, and even after tuberculosis was sort of like proven to be mm -hmm. airborne, I mean, I don't, I mean, it was like basically people had the idea that it was airborne long before it was this particular study, but yep. 
then it was like, okay, well, tuberculosis is airborne, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, oh, okay. But like sometimes measles is also airborne. Right. So like tuberculosis, measles and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing a resistance to like adding things into Mm -hmm. that where it's like almost everything is droplets, but like some of these are aerosols. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a reluctance sort of um shift that paradigm completely yeah. from like droplet based transmission to like aerosol transmission right and like in reality right it's probably both end right like we love to put things in boxes because it feels neat mm-hmm. and it's reassuring right but in reality those are kind of you know those are quite porous concepts as oh yeah both, absolutely right? well that was sort of the point one of the points of the project was that we're making this really artificial distinction between okay if it's this small it's airborne and if it's this small it's it, this big it's droplet mm-hmm. and it's like those are not things stay it depends and this was this was dr bariba's expertise like it depends on how forcefully someone coughs mm-hmm. right or it, it like there are all these different um factors in what stays in the air mm-hmm. whether something can be infectious like with smallpox smallpox is like mostly close range transmission but sometimes it's not mm-hmm. you know and it, it so we we have these different things and like you were saying it's a very it's very much more fluid than we want because it that makes it hard if we acknowledge that like we have to prepare for multiple kind of tra- modes of transmission um and we have to look at air filtration systems and we have to keep windows open and we have to like that, that requires a change in infrastructure. Yes, that it's expensive. It's so yeah. expensive. Like droplets is so cheap, right? Yeah. And sanitizer. Great. Problem solved. Mm-hmm. Put know? a mask on, stay six feet away. Yeah. And it's uh, not that those things, I mean, those things have, have shown so. the yeah. <laughs> transmission. Absolutely. Um, but it's like, no one wants to cough up the money to overhaul hospital and school filtration systems. Right. And so when you're talking about the reluctance to make that shift to acknowledging airborne transmission, um, like the infrastructure is a huge thing. It's not just about, oh, we need to just like have as much scientific research as we can to persuade mm-hmm. someone. And this is where we get, people have this idea that if you like you just present the facts that people will be persuaded and it's like, oh, if only, right? But there are so many other factors that go into that, including money. And what people are willing to spend money on to like make these mm-hmm. that shift. I am, um, uh, you know, Charlie has her ridiculous best friend. Um, her best friend's yes. uncle is a um, is an architect. Um, his wife used to work in our school of architecture. I was talking to them the other week, and I asked whether the ventilation stuff that's coming out of COVID was um, coming across into architecture. Um, or when mm. when he thought it would and he said that um, it's not a big factor in his practice because he's a residential architect and so ventilation has kind of always been a big factor of being able to like throw open the windows you know here in Queensland we have I'll send you a picture later um, you know it's like the subtropics our characteristic yeah. architecture is Queenslander houses with these huge verandas where you very southern um yeah we mm-hmm. were meant to be able to open up all the windows and yeah just have the air coming through um and so the ventilation has always been there in residential um but then in commercial um he thinks it's not going to change at all until the building codes change which is a multi-year mm-hmm. um yeah is you know certainly a multi-year um thing because you know, it's incredibly expensive to have the energy efficiency that lets you um, air condition a air condition a building, and um, to be able to do that and be able to open the windows, or be able to put in like a much bigger ventilation mm-hmm. system, or to be able to put in filters, you know, which is just not in our in our codes at all, really. Yeah. I mean, one of your, I think one of the questions you had, had sent, um, and I don't want to like, Oh no, we got distracted. (laughs) Yeah. But one of the, one of the questions was like, um, how are we just ignoring information that's like right in front of our faces basically? Yeah. Like that's existed for a hundred years. Um, and it's like, well, that's, that's, that's if this information kind of exists in a vacuum in which like we learn a new thing and then everything is just like can uh align with that that yeah. kind of research but in reality you, you're fighting against a lot of inertia mm-hmm. 
um, in terms of technology and infrastructure and language and yeah. disciplinary silos. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's um, most scientific uh, shifts happen not immediately, but over, uh, it takes a lot of effort. Right. Uh, and a, and a, a lot of uh, kind of time and energy. And one of the things that our team was asking for was like, we need to put the time and energy into making this shift. Yeah. Um, instead of just dealing with it when it comes up, when there's like a flu pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, or a COVID pandemic, like we just need to put the time in the research in now. Yeah. Because this will have long term benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because it will transfer across, right? Oh, hundred like, percent. And like it's like, I, yeah, but it, it, and it's like, you know, if you, if you basically, if you take the understanding, if you, if you understand that this sort of like droplet aerosol dichotomy has been artificial in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. then you can start saying, okay, well, like maybe flu also is spread by aerosols or maybe like the common cold. Right. Mm -hmm. And changing these things and dealing with these things also affects diseases and illnesses that we've just taken for granted as something mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, like this many people die of the flu every year. Right. I right? think and here in maybe, Australia, we did, we, no flu this past year. Yeah. Not, I, I don't think we had, I, I remember it being noteworthy that we didn't have any pediatric deaths from flu this right. year, yeah. which was like not a thing that had happened before. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, it, it, this not, it's not just COVID. It's like this overarching understanding mm -hmm. of infection and what that yeah. means and um like what we'll accept as like a tolerable amount of, of death basically yeah i remember those early discussions around tolerable amounts of death yeah oh yeah, yeah. i mean it's i mean different it's horrible, horrible, right? to ours, but um yeah 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 oh yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> like a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i think that's, really i mean that's one of the oh go ahead no you go ahead I, I, that, that's one of the things that I really liked about doing this kind of interdisciplinary project um, because we, we actually had a difficult time getting this research published. People were really excited about it, but it couldn't find a home. We, you know, it just came out in interface focus as, a as part of a special issue, but we had submitted it to two different journals before then. We're like, you know, Lindsay and Jose are like big names in their field, especially right now. Mm -hmm. And editors were like, we really just don't know what to do with this. You know, it wasn't historical enough for historical journals and it wasn't scientific enough for science journals. Yeah. And we're like, the whole point is that we put together this interdisciplinary team to point out that these disciplinary silos aren't working. And in fact, they're keeping us from scientific progress. And we like couldn't find, we were like laughing about it, that we couldn't find a journal that would publish it where they're like, yeah, it's great, but our journal doesn't do interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were like, well, there are interdisciplinary journals, but their impact factor is low. So the people who need to read it, like public health officials and doctors mm -hmm. won't see it. Yeah. And so it was, it was a weird, it was a weird lesson in exactly the problem that I had been studying, which is. Yeah people um, only kind of speaking to their own communities mm -hmm. and, and not seeing where um, things were like going off the rails a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And people picking things up without thinking about the context as well. Yeah. yeah. Or like picking it up from someone in another discipline right. and like not, you know, not. Yeah, thinking exactly. Like, oh, maybe they're using airborne to mean something different mm -hmm. than how I'm using it. Yeah. 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 And that was that, that, it, it's really the pattern the whole way through, you know, the through that historical that historical context, um, right up through the last eighteen months, um, yeah. where you know we were hearing COVID is airborne. And what is it? March twenty twenty, I think, was the first time mm -hmm. I heard it. Like, and yeah. it wasn't until I think we had what like November last year. The CDC like put it up and took it down again. Was that? I think I think it, it was like late summer the CDC put something up and it was like that like struggle of like are they going to keep it up are they mm -hmm. going to and I think I think that's when they put it up and then took it down and yeah. then, but it was like it was like the end of the summer I remember them really acknowledging like okay okay maybe this is the thing we need to like worry yeah. about I remember it was um 
one of the hotel quarantine legs here and it was like April of this year was the first time I heard an Australian government official say actually this is airborne wild when you think about the ruby princess is one of those examples that um, yeah absolutely always comes up for airborne and that was here you know but yeah yeah well and it's it's the same i mean it was wild to do this kind of research and see these like very similar conversations Mm -hmm. where you know william wells would be like there's evidence that tuberculosis is airborne you know Mm -hmm. in the 40s or or whatever and then to have someone who was like the director of what would have been, um, he was the the director of the epidemiological unit of what would become the CDC. And he was like, no, that's not, that's not real. He's like, if we have to worry about aerosol um, viruses, it would be from like bio warfare, right? Like as they went into World War II and the Cold War, they were worried about an enemy of the United States mm-hmm dropping a bomb with some sort of aerosolized virus and killing everyone right mm-hmm. but they were like but it doesn't occur naturally mm-hmm. it would have to be man-made um and and so it's a lot of the same and they used a lot of the same sort of like dismissive like if it was airborne we would be seeing it much more widely or well you know you did this study but here oh here's another thing is that it's very hard to prove if things are in the air because um, like you can pick it up from other places, right? It's right. Like, so it's got to well, be an ex- you- it's it's got to be an exclusion. Like you cannot find another yeah. way for it to have happened. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. It's like if if it could be anything other than aerosol, they're going to go with that explanation. Mm-hmm. And and that was the same in you know the 1930s, and it's the same now. I mean, right, that it's like you have to kind of prove even more so that it's like, no, it couldn't have been anything else other than airborne. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But again, it's like, you know, uh, we're having these same kind of conversations um, and it's the, the scientists that pulled me onto the team were like, all we want is to stop having this conversation. Like all we want is for this to be a permanent, like, yes, respiratory diseases other than tuberculosis, measles, and chicken pox can be spread through the air. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what are we going to do about that? Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit. So this is kind of like our big picture scientific epistemologies policy crossover up there. Um, one of the things that we're seeing coming out of COVID is a lot of individual level responses Mm -hmm. um, in a bunch of different ways. Um, I have to introduce you at some point to my colleague, Amy Hickman here at UQ, who is a rhetorician uh, working in our public health department. Um, Yes, I think you've told me about Amy before. Yeah, Amazing. Amy's my favourite. One of the things we've been working on is like kind of a community tactical tech com stuff around how communities step in to provide health information when institutions fail. Um, Yes. So we've seen some of those interventions, you know, we've seen in Australia, we saw um, masking advice being produced by community organisations at least a year ahead of um, when our governments were talking about it. Um, I think that's like the the Black Lives Matter protests. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen uh, in the US, we've seen the, um, uh, the... filter boxes the box fan filter boxes oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Oh, what are those called they, um course coursey rosenthal oh yeah and, and, and so it's it. just, mm. like the h the hvac filters like all taped together in a box yeah around yeah. a box fan right yeah yeah exactly so the filters for, i'm explaining it for australians we don't have this um oh. yeah right um we do not have central home aircon and heating in the way that you all do in the u.s and um, it's so hot there. Yeah, we summer. mostly have like wall mounted um reverse cycle aircon. Um okay. yeah, and like some some folks will have like central stuff, but it's not like mm. a big central unit like I had in Texas. I see, I see. And yeah. it doesn't have like the same kinds of filter things on it. So it's basically like a vacuum filter, but a foot square. Um, and you make a box out it's of them. It's probably much more stuff. energy efficient than the U.S. So I <laughs> like the, just like having a huge central AC. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they're meant to be pretty good. But um, I'm, I'm not sure about the heating stuff. We've got a lot of like wood heating and stuff down here. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, okay, so we've seen like um, DIY filtration systems, we saw um, DIY mask patterns, and we've also seen like kind of the other side of it, which is like ivermectin and bleach and um, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things, like we talk about this in rhetoric and technical communications, that idea of like how do we equip people to like do their own research and to navigate um yeah, to navigate information systems in the internet and um, how does how do ideas and information and misinformation like circulate and and take hold? Um, I don't know. I don't have like a really neatly formulated question on that. I guess it's like, what's your take? What do you see happening in this space at the moment? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the problems is that. It, it we have we have made it such so that people have to feel like it's an individual responsibility like obviously during a pandemic like there are sacrifices like you need there are individual actions you have to take but one of the differences between something is in the air and something is only close range transmission is that one of those two things puts a lot more burden on the individual to prevent it from happening. Right. So like, it's your responsibility to stay six feet away. It's your responsibility to wash your hands. Again, all those things are good things. Mm -hmm. We should do those things. And I'm as frustrated with anyone that like, as, as frustrated as anyone that like people won't keep a freaking mask on their face. Right. But the airborne side is like, okay, we need institutions to upgrade filtration systems for our public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We can't just stay a few feet apart and wear a mask and hope that that's gonna solve the problem. And so I think that's part of the reluctance too, right? Is that we want it, and this is something we talk about in health and medical rhetoric, like we want people to be good health citizens. Mm -hmm. And that means putting the burden of healthiness and safety on them as individuals, mm -hmm. instead of addressing it at an institutional level where they would have to take responsibility. They want it so that you, the burden can be on us. And then if something bad happens, they're like, well, you should have not st stood three feet away from someone. You should have mm -hmm. stood six, you know? And, and so it's like, how is it your fault that you got infected? Mm -hmm. Not like, how have we failed as an institution and as like a community? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's part of it, I think. And then, you know, obviously, like on the tech comm side, right? Like you have competing sources of information and authority and expertise. And I think at some level, especially in the United States, this was always going to be a political thing mm -hmm. um, because of who the president was when all this like went down. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that you have to get like, the CDC wanted to make the messaging very like they went in with the idea, I think. And I don't, again, this is like, goes back to what you said about why questions. Mm -hmm. I'm not, a, I wasn't in the room. I don't know how these decisions were made, but when the CDC is like masks don't work and they think that if you come out really strong and really forceful, that people will be like, wow, it's a very like masculine mm -hmm. way of approaching communication, right? That if you just say it with enough confidence that people will, just accept you as the authority on the subject. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have to turn around two weeks later and say, J actually, mm -hmm. LOL, masks do work. Mm -hmm. um, now it like all it does, all you've done is undermine the stuff you said before. So I mm -hmm. think in terms of empowering people to make these decisions in a pandemic that we've not experienced in generations, right? You have to like think of it in terms of how you're, how the consumer is consuming mm -hmm. the, the content, like they, they're getting a messy situation. And so you have to guide them through the messiness mm -hmm. instead of just thinking that if you can just say it firmly enough that they will listen to you, right? This message of like, well, just like listen to the scientists. And it's like, well, I think like the research I did shows pretty well that scientists don't always agree on stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, what scientists are they supposed to listen to? You've got some doctors in the U.S. saying hydroxychloroquine cures COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, they're listening to that doctor. Isn't that what you told them to do? Talk to your doctor, listen to the scientists. And so it, when people don't have the scientific literacy, and most people don't, to say like, 
let me read these studies and kind of figure out where they peer reviewed, where were they published, Mm -hmm. were they replicated, right? Like people don't have that level of knowledge. They're getting bombarded with a fire hose of information Mm -hmm. all the time. And so we have to be really careful about these appeals to authority and instead work through, right? Like the, the stickiness of how these things are decided and, and have, you know, build trust Mm -hmm. in here's, we're working through this with you. We're giving you information as, as it happens. Um, but here are things that we're doing to keep Mm -hmm. you safe, right? We're upgrading this and this and this, instead of just like, we're just going to tell you what to do. And we're going to change that guidance like out from under you so that you're never really sure what's safe and what's not. It makes it really difficult for people to assess their level of risk. Yeah, right. Exactly. And risk communication is notoriously, notoriously difficult, right? Yeah, super difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are so many factors that you can't, basically, like, I just keep coming back to that, that um, idea of like ethos, right? Of like building trust, not just authority. The CDC wanted to be an authority, but they, mm-hmm. they, that came at the cost, I think of actually like building trust with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I don't think there was anything to be done to make this like a not political issue in the United States. Like it was always going to be very polarizing because it becomes an identity thing. You know, it's a whole, we could go into all that, but I think there were, there are ways to do this kind of messy, like embrace the messiness Mm -hmm. um, of the science in the communication, instead of trying to mask the messiness with your communication. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get people to be okay with uncertainty? Right. Yeah. And I think we have to move past this idea that like science is settled or that scientists have all the answers. It's like scientists will tell you that they don't science. They're having conversations behind the scenes where they're arguing about, okay, well, what's the best way to approach this? And Mm -hmm. is this significant? Is this not? And it's like, that is, it's, this is a perennial problem in rhetoric of science. Like, how do you point out, how do you point out the messiness of science without undermining people's trust in science? Um, And I think, I think there's a way to do that. I think that people are okay with it in ways that we think that maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a version of this where we have a lot more trust in people than we do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like like people and can I think, make good decisions, you know? Yeah. They yeah. can. And I and I think they can do it without the paternalism of like we know what's best for you and we will tell you what to do, mm-hmm. which, you know, doesn't work if then you have to turn around and be like, "Oh, all that stuff we told you really authoritatively to do, like mm, that mm-hmm. is actually the best thing to do anymore yeah um yeah Yeah. it's it's a it's a little bit I mean it's not gaslighting but it's a little bit of that vibe of like wait but you told us I I'm like I've had friends reach out to me and they're just like I thought I swear that this is what the CDC said and I'm like Mm -hmm. they did say that at one point Mm -hmm. but then they erased it from the internet and now they just say this thing with no record that they said right. that before. It's right? always been this way, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? George Orwell, is it Margaret Atwood? Like, it's always, oh. what is it? It's, yeah, what? it's like we've always point. been, a, yeah. we've always been at war with Oceania. Oh, geez, that was so I long. I haven't read it in so long. But yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, it, it, yeah, it makes you question the reality you thought you had. And it's just been like, and, and again, they do that because they think that to do anything other than that, this is me speculating, right? Hmm. My guess is they do that because to admit fault or at messiness is they think undermining their authority right. when in fact not doing that is like eroding is undermining the trust that people might have had in them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like that trust is probably the more sustaining thing. You know, we can exactly. think about this with our even with like interpersonal relationships, right? Like yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but like, I think if like being a little kid and you know, no, you can't have a kid, no, you can't have a kid, no, you can't have a kid, and okay, fine, mm-hmm. and that like made it very easy to go in the next time and say, yeah, I know you're saying this, but yeah, mm-hmm. but I don't really believe you. Anymore. I don't really believe you anymore. Yeah. yeah, it's like you have to. I think more than anything with public health communication, you have to trust that the people giving you information have your best interest at heart yeah and that they're not just telling it to you to control you or be the boss of you or because they think you're an idiot right Mm -hmm. but because 
they, they, they are really trying to work with you to make this better. Yeah. And, and that, to you do know, we, we, the best they can with the information they have at the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, that, you know, and this is, this is another reason why, like in the U S particularly, right. We have a long and storied history of like aggressive medical racism and where public health officials have, you know, done things to black patients and communities that eroded lots of trust because mm-hmm. there was, they were not working in the best interests of the communities they were supposed to serve. Or if they did, it was from a very like white savior kind of standpoint where they thought they were helping, but they really weren't. Um, and so now you see like the public health outcomes of that decades later are that you have communication issues in certain communities because people don't trust you. Right. Um, and so it's not just like the, the process of regaining trust after you've lost it mm-hmm. is like, that is like a generational, multi-generational task. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's like, you can't, you, you can't, I, like, in my opinion, you can't just like throw that trust building out the window mm-hmm. to save a, your authority. Um, yeah. it, it, if you've got to pick one or the other, like your yeah. trust is what's going to get people in the doctor's office. One of the ways, authority. one of the ways we've seen that play out here in Australia is that our indigenous, our community led indigenous COVID response early on was incredibly effective. Um, there were no Indigenous deaths from COVID in Australia until wow. this year, um, like the last couple of months. Um, there was no COVID in any of the rem- remote communities. Um, and these were community-driven, community-led health initiatives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, our vaccination rollout disaster, as you may be aware, um, sort of like gotten, gotten it together recently, <laughs> but was not great um, yeah. for quite a while. Um, but it was government-led. It was government messaging. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see uh, the we see huge disparities in vaccination rates based on communities. Um, and it's not just about mm-hmm. access. It's about trust and about who is doing the, that messaging and doing those interventions. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, you can... I think we do get bogged down in the idea of... I mean, access is, like, a huge part of this too, but... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can have a million vaccination clinics, but nobody's going to go if they don't believe that you are someone they can trust, you know, with their health. And that, you know, if they, um, if, if they have some reason to distrust you, they're going to look for other, you know, like doctors on the internet who will mm-hmm. prescribe them ivermectin. Mm-hmm. Right? And so it's, it, it, it's not just a matter of like, they're not getting like they're not listening to you. It's that they are now actively listening to someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, you know, one of the questions that from your students was we have this very rapid media landscape now in ways that we've never really have never had for any other pandemic. And we have information from all these different sources Mm -hmm. and how does that affect it? And it's like, well, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the, the things we see is that, if um, when, when that, that sort of relationship is broken or lost or, mm-hmm. or fails to be established, there are many other people that are like that have white coats, right? That are willing to step right into that space and become yeah. that that authority. Yeah. And speak to fear. I mean, and they, and they say like, yeah, your fears are valid. The government um, does not have your best interest at heart. Mm-hmm. They are trying to control you. They are. This vaccine is not safe. Mm-hmm. I am keeping you safe. So this is a thing that's tested and all this, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff. And, and yeah. it's like the science does not say that ivermectin oh. works, mm-hmm. but it's persuasive nonetheless because of the ways um, that communities rally around it or, or different doctors talk mm-hmm. about it. Right. So, yeah. 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 All right. I've, we've talked for so long. I have one last substantive question, if that's yeah. okay. Um, so obviously this is a global problem, you know, it has different dimensions in different places, um, as we've talked about. Um, and one of the things we've seen is, you know, institutions, particularly in the US, um, the CDC has emerged as like a global authority, obviously, um, uh, World Health Organization is international. Um, Mm -hmm. In your article, uh, you and your co-authors call for a model to continue advancing research in this area. Um, 
what do you think that could look like at a global scale? What kind of entity or organisation or coalition or whatever um, do you think could best steward that kind of an initiative? Yeah, I was, you know, I read that question and I've been kind of mulling it over and I meant to ask um, Lindsay Marr about her thoughts on it, because I think the idea of like an international scientific coalition is something that has been a lot on her mind, right? Mm -hmm. More so than mine, because that's not, um, we don't have that sort of like rapid fire, like let's share research around the world to address this like very immediate problem. Um, and I, you know, the, the WHO, you think, okay, they're positioned to oversee some kind of thing like this. Um, they have the, um, the, the, like the, the history, they have the international reach, um, and they're not without their problems, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also, they were, it, they took even longer than the CDC to recognize that COVID was airborne. Mm -hmm. um, and so the WHO is not even though they've led initiatives against measles and smallpox and polio and malaria and really like important public health issues, um, they maybe are not positioned to move quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had uh, a more kind of community ground, like grassroots coalition of scholars across universities, which I think, um, and you know, I'm not, I, this is like outside of kind of my expertise, but um, my understanding is that what, that's what's happened during COVID is mm -hmm. that scholars kind of rallied around this issue and, you know, shared Google drives and Dropboxes mm -hmm. and had this sort of like very quick, these communication practices. Um, so maybe if it's housed in a university, it may be a bit of a faster sort mm -hmm. of response. Right. Yeah. And so I think and when you're, um, what, but I, what I would like to see from the humanities side of it, right? Even if I can't speak as much to mm -hmm. how scientific coalitions are, are built, um, I would but like to see something that's, hmm. oh. But it's not ahead. even just like a scientific coalition, right? Like as, as we've been saying, like you need to have humanities folks in yeah. there because it's not just yeah, about like, totally right. it's not just about like maths yeah. or physics, right? Like these mm -hmm. are transdisciplinary, necessarily yeah. transdisciplinary collaborations. Yeah. Because- Yeah, you're actually right. Yeah. And to that point, you know, maybe it's, it's expanding, like kind of what I was talking about, where it's like, we couldn't find a publishing home for this research, right? Maybe having interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary research centers, right? Mm -hmm. That are, instead of saying, we're going to focus on this discipline, it's like, we're going to focus on this problem, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a center for aerosol studies um, that includes people from a range of disciplines, like maybe something like that already exists. Mm -hmm. Like Virginia Tech has something called the Biocomplexity Institute, mm -hmm. which oh, the has- the vaccine project at Virginia Tech, right? Is yeah, multidisciplinary yeah. like and that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like having something, but you need, you need money to do that, right? Um, but I think scholars would jump at that opportunity to mm -hmm. have a space, like a publishing space, a research space, a funding space mm -hmm. to work across disciplines on these kinds of problems. Yeah. Um, and I, I would like it to, to, I would like to see it not be so like US centric, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of like global public health initiatives um, have been. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like, look at the vaccine disparities between the United States where we're getting our third shots and like countries uh, in Africa, right? Not where, the they, um, yeah, a lot of them haven't even gotten any vaccinations um, yeah. yet. Um, and so I, I would like to see any sort of global initiative. I would like to see it be much more equitable. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that's where humanities scholars can come in, right? And and say and social science um, scholars and say like, here are the issues. Not you know you've got the science, but like how are we going to make this equitable on a global scale? Yeah. How do we take the science and put it into practice? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what are the you know what are the um, the barriers to that, what are um, internationally um, and kind of like on the ground mm -hmm. um, and how do we, how do we work together to make sure that we're not just developing science, but actually making science accessible um, yeah. in, in all the ways that that can mean. Yeah. yeah. So important. Just, and like so exciting. It's so important and so frustrating as well. <laughs> Oh yeah. I mean, so yeah. frustrating. Right. But you know, it's nice. Um, 
it's nice to do research that you look at it. I mean, if I, if I had done this research on my own, people would have been like, okay, it would have been, I would have presented it at a rhetoric conference and it would have been it, but you know, yep. it, it was because it was with Lindsay Marr and mm -hmm. Jose Jimenez. And it was mm -hmm. with these people who were like, we have the spotlight. I mean, Lindsay and Jose could have said whatever they wanted. Right. And people would have been like, oh yeah, but they recognized they didn't have, they had, they had enough kind of like disciplinary humility to be like, we need people who have expertise in this and we don't, you know? Thing and so about, mm, I'll, the, go ahead. Uh, the other thing I think about with you coming into that project as a grad student is not just um, that idea of like, actually we need expertise from somebody else, but it's actually like opening the door for somebody junior as well. Yeah. So you have to and they made me. And they paid yeah. you. They paid me. And that does and not in, happen, you know? <laughs> No, I mean, right. they could have easily been like, you're lucky to be on this project. Mm -hmm. Do you want it or not? And instead they were like, here's what we're paying you. We're going to set up a contract and make sure it's, you know, all right. Yeah. And they made me first author on that paper. Like I did the bulk of the writing. So I mm -hmm. think that was appropriate, but they very early on, the discussion was who's going to be first author on this paper, because yeah. that's important in the sciences. Right. Um, and they, it was unanimously like, hey, you should have it. Katie's yeah. the most junior scholar on the team. This is like, and our hope was to actually have it um, published like before I graduated. So I could use it in like job applications and that didn't happen, but that's okay. Um, but like but they could have used the preprint. I, and I did on a yeah. couple and there were, mm -hmm. there were a couple where I like hadn't gotten jobs and I sent yeah. them the link to the preprint. Like, mm -hmm. Hey, just, mm -hmm. I published this. FYI. <laughs> You missed out, right? Yeah. But um, it, so it, but it was it was a, a lot of generosity on their part mm -hmm. um, to kind of put me center stage, and you know, with the Wired article, Lindsay mm -hmm. could have just done that whole thing, that whole profile herself. Mm -hmm. But she was like, she told Megan, the reporter, you need to talk to Katie because Katie mm -hmm. did the work on this. Right. Um, and that is like I would say, just as a student, like find mentors and work mm -hmm. with people who will do that for you. Yeah. Um, because I've also worked with people who don't do that. Yeah. Um, and will, who will not go out of their way to like put grad students um, center stage. Yeah. And so it was it, it was a very clear difference um, mm -hmm. you know, working with people who were invested in my success and um, my knowledge. It was really awesome sitting in these Zoom calls and having them these like senior scholars listen with rapt attention. Well, I tell them about what I discovered and then be like, that's amazing work, Katie. Like, what a good, you did great. And I'm like, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I did. Um, but that is like, you know, you don't get that sometimes as a grad student very much. Oh. Um, and so it was really, it was really rewarding having them appreciate my work. Yeah. Yeah. For me, looking at it from the outside, I just kind of looked at them like, God, like that's how you do it. Right. Like that is how you do the work of mm -hmm. teaching and mentoring and lifting people up. and yeah helping them to and these are do what they want to do. Not even in my field. What? Like not even, they had no idea what I did. They were like, oh yeah, yeah Katie does uh, history or something. And I'm like, yeah. no, I don't, I don't, not really. Yeah. Um, but they, they ran, you know, they, they were like, we're going to learn what you do. And we're going to mm -hmm. like, let you, we're going to give you all the rain you need to do it. You know? mm -hmm. Truly amazing. It was, they were great. Yeah. All right. Last question. Um, yeah. So you told us at the start you finished your PhD and we were just talking about the horror show that is job applications. Okay. Um, I'm not going to ask you about that. Um, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, what, are we, what, what should we be looking out for from you? Right now I am working on uh, emotionally recovering from getting a PhD. <laughs> working on sleep. <laughs> I'm working on doing things that I enjoy with my life instead of the last five years of slogging through academic literature. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm teaching, I, right now I'm, I'm teaching technical writing. Um, and I, what I want to do is I want to go back into that literature about um, how these early aerosol scientists were trying to persuade the public health community that um, airborne infection was a thing they should take seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and they used, uh, you know, like this, the rhetorical strategies, like talking about miasma theory, like I talked mm -hmm. about before, like the rhetorical strategies they use to try and make that happen. Mm -hmm. And then how that also shows up in present day, like a lot mm -hmm. of the same like metaphors, like you'll see uh, contemporary aerosol scientists will say it travels through the air like smoke. Right. Um, 
And yeah, secondhand smoke is the one that we get a lot. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a metaphor that they were using even in the early 20th century mm-hmm. to try and get people to visual because you can't see it. Right. Mm-hmm. So they were trying to use something where it's like, here is something that works similar in a physics way that your nose yeah. can detect. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's fascinating. Um, and so I'd really like to, uh, that has to be the next thing I work on because I proposed it for a conference. Um, so I have to at some point do it. Which one? Um, uh, RSA. Oh, well, I have to, I guess I'm I guess I'll see you there. <laughs> oh yeah. I guess I have to wait to see if we get accepted. I'm like yeah. being, I'm putting the cart before the horse there. Uh, um, Leslie posted this morning that they're thinking the first week in November, they'll have acceptances yeah, out. Yeah. I, I mean, have, there's not a rush. I don't care. <laughs> it's like yeah, whenever you get to it. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know if I'll make it, but I uh, know oh, I applied for the yeah. online version anyway. I forgot. Oh, I don't remember. I have no recollection of how I, I was, I'm like on a panel. So oh, I yeah. wasn't like the one who did the submission. So mm-hmm. I'm like, mm. yeah. Um, but mm. that, that's the next thing. I mean, I, I um, career wise, I'd really like to focus on health communication in refugee resettlement. I'm really passionate about that. Um, but I think there's still a lot to explore with this project mm-hmm. um, from the re- rhetoric and technical communication side. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd like to sort of like, ride that wave a little bit and see if we can um get more into like these paradigm shifts in science Mm -hmm. and the reluctance that people have to kind of embrace different understandings of infection Mm -hmm. amazing awesome it's been so good talking to you it's been so fun I know I love talking Um, to you I know it's always it's always fun I know I wish we get your job down here still want that uh yeah well look I have my student had my student my husband has like two three more years until his student Mm -hmm. loans are forgiven so after then we can go anywhere it's is it not a we have a version there used to be a version here where you um I mean I didn't pay any of mine back for the entire time I was in grad school because uh they didn't because I wasn't making money in Australia so they just didn't do anything um yeah anyway um yeah i really appreciate you taking the time um to tell us all about this um at incredible life um yeah and i know my students are really going to appreciate it as well so thank you on their thank you on their behalf yeah and if they have any questions about you know i've worked now i've worked in like medical publishing i've done the grad school thing obviously Mm -hmm. um i i do contracting work for technical writing Oh, yeah. um, and that's been going really well too. I didn't oh, even good. mention that, but that's out of this project. Um, people who are interested in like air quality testing mm-hmm. have reached out to me and I'm oh. working with them on adapting the science for different audiences. So I'm doing that. Um, so basically if your students have any questions about mm-hmm. like n- different kinds of jobs mm-hmm. or like anything, any, anything else that comes out of this conversation, mm-hmm. they can email me. You can give them my email address okay. well, um, and I'm happy to, to chat with them. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Let me hit stop on this and then...